Joining me now live in the studio is the Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister, Richard Miles. Thanks for your time as always. Good to be here, Karen. Peter Dutton says you should have gone bigger in the support package. And why no Hawkeyes? Well, uh, firstly, in terms of the size of the package, we are now and have been the largest non-NATO, one of the largest non-NATO contributors to uh, supporting Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine certainly understand that we're punching above our weight in that respect. We're one of the largest contributors in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so, you know, there is a, a, a balancing act here in terms of what are our own needs with our capability, but also making sure that we stand with Ukraine um, in the defence of their country, but also in the defence of the global rules-based order in which our national interest is so significantly engaged. And so this is a significant package. It's, uh, we've been essentially doing packages every three or four months since we, we've come to office. Um, in respect of Hawkeyes, we've spoken with Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine came to us with a, 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 on this occasion with a menu of uh, items that they thought could help in terms of assisting them. We've worked with them in relation to that. Um, we had real concerns about what Hawk, how Hawkeye would operate in their environment. Um, and we've obviously been talking through that with them. Uh, and the package is what we've come up with. The, the Hawkeye is a, an armoured vehicle like the Bushmaster. They clearly believe that the Bushmaster has worked very effectively for them. And they wanted Bushmasters, Hawkeyes or Abrams tanks. It doesn't look like you've delivered on any of those in this package? Well, the, the 113s, of which we're providing 28, um, is uh, an infantry fighting vehicle um, and, and it is much more suited to the environment that they're in now, right now. I mean, the Hawkeyes are, are not really like Bushmasters. They're a much lighter vehicle. In fact, they're, de they're really designed to be carried around by helicopters, which is not the context in which we uh, see this fight here. Um, but And there are other issues that we think mean the Hawkeyes were not particularly suitable for Ukraine. I mean, we want to come up with assistance which is practical and which is going to make a difference. We've talked that through with Ukraine. They understand that and they understand um, the issues that we've raised around Hawkeyes. But, I mean, they're pretty happy with the package that we've announced. Uh, and it does include infantry fighting vehicles, which is very much at the core of what they were seeking, um, along with uh, special operation vehicles, um, armoured trucks... Uh, it, it's, um, it's a significant package which will make a difference. We're very proud to be a, to, to make the announcement. OK, well, I'll put you another critique. This was from Michael Shoebridge, former ASPE, now independent defence strategist. He says the Australian government, Ukraine support, fails to meet the lowest expectations. He said uh, on uh, his social media post, 70 military vehicles includes 28 trucks, 28 obsolete Vietnam-era M. 113s that were destined for the boneyard. And he said, if that's it, Mr Albanese should stay away from the NATO meeting in July. Well, again, uh, I'll, we'll take our cues from the, the government of Ukraine, um, uh, rather than Michael Shoebridge, and, uh, and the government of Ukraine have made really clear their support for it. They've made that publicly... Um, they've put out a public message since we've made the announcement earlier this morning. Um, it is a very significant package. It's in addition to the uh, 28 113s that we've sent previously, which are currently being used in Ukraine and which, which are suitable to the environment in which this uh, conflict is happening um, and, and it represents a very significant package. I mean, the point I, I would make is that Ukraine understand we are punching above our weight here um, and they've been very clear about that, as have um, NATO and Europe. Uh, and so this will be very well received. We are, as I say, we are one of the largest non-NATO contributors to this conflict. The, the largest is Sweden and they're about to join NATO. Uh, so, so that phrase may change in the next month. Um, and, and I think the fact that we are giving this support from this side of the world is something that's very well understood. And um, Minister Reznikov, my counterpart in Ukraine, has been publicly thanking us just in the last couple of hours. And, and with the Hawkeye, it, it's not because of some issue with the brakes or some mechanical problem that you haven't offered them? Uh, look, I don't think... It, it, I'm not going to go through the specifics of that um, in public. Uh, we have talked through these issues with Ukraine. We want to make a difference in terms of the contribution that we are making. We did not believe the Hawkeyes would be uh, suitable and would be of assistance, and that was something that Ukraine understood. Is there a chance the Prime Minister might go further when he gets to NATO, or is this the package he's taking? Well, I think, look, uh, what I would say is um, look at our form. I mean, the, the point that we've been making is that we want to support Ukraine um, for as long as it takes for Ukraine to resolve this conflict on, on its terms. 
and we see this as a protracted conflict, which is um, you know, going to go for a, a significant amount of time. Uh, since we've been in government, we've been making um, iterative announcements of support for Ukraine every four months or so, um, in July, October and February and now in June. Um, most of the military support that has been provided by the Australian government to Ukraine has happened since the last election. Um, and, and that's an important point to understand. We will stay with Ukraine for as long as it takes. And in terms of what we announce in the future, I think you can look at the way in which we've been conducting ourselves in the past to get a sense of that. All right. So on Russia more broadly, is Russia weaker today than it was last week of, after the aborted uprising? I think the answer to that question is yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to uh, get a very clear sense of, of what's happening in Russia, obviously. Um, but uh, this is a significant set of events which has occurred over the weekend. I, don't, I think they're unquestionably weaker uh, when you look at that. Um, and to me, what it, what it brings in to, to light really is, is the whole um, uh, immorality of the invasion by Russia of Ukraine uh, last year um, and, and the kind of morale which underpins that. I think we can see that that is breaking down in the context of uh, what has happened with the Wagner Group. Uh, but there's still a long way to go here. And, you know, uh, President Putin is still very much in charge of Russia uh, and there is still very much a conflict which is going to take uh, time to uh, conclude between Ukraine and Russia now. And with, with Putin himself, do you think it's a matter of time? Is, is this a vulnerability now for for him, that he will, he'll eventually meet his demise? Look, I'm not going to speculate uh, about things as, as kind of firmly as that. It's obviously... Um, I mean, there's a crack in the edifice is the way I suppose I would describe it. Um, but um, how big that is and its significance, I think, time will tell. Uh, Vladimir Putin is still very much in control of Russia and there is still very much a conflict taking place in Ukraine right now. And, you know, from our point of view... Um, we are can, going to continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine for as long as it takes. I want to ask you about Simon Crane. One thing I, I didn't ask you, but I want to get on uh, before we, we move on, is the, the costs of this latest deployment and offering, mm -hmm. is that going to be have to paid by defence by making other cuts? Uh, well, we, we, defence is able to absorb this, so, so it is going to be covered by defence. Uh, I, I mean, the... the the one point I'd make is that there is a, an operational deployment in, in place right now of Australian personnel, which is the trainers in Britain who are, as part of Operation Kudu, who are helping train the Ukrainian armed forces and, and kind of funding rules around operations apply to that. Uh, but this is, this is being funded by Defence and, 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 you know, we, we understand that in the sense that this is going to be a balancing act as we go forward. Um, it, it, it's a matter of making sure that we are able to play the part that we can for Ukraine. They are in a serious conflict which, ha which it does engage our national interests. At the same time, um, we obviously have to be thinking about our own capabilities and, and that's part of the considerations that we've been thinking about as every country who has been supporting Ukraine has been thinking about. And as I mentioned, Simon Crean came as a great shock to many in Labor and, and beyond who, who knew him. And really warm praise for, for him across the political aisle as well. Yeah, I think it... it well, that reflects the, the nature of who, who Simon was as a, as a person. I mean, Simon was a, a warm, uh, generous person who for, certainly for me was always there to provide advice, to give support uh, throughout my career, really, and before I entered Parliament when I was at the ACTU. He, at that point, was a former president of the ACTU and... Um, but, but maintained an ongoing contact with the ACTU. Uh, and I think my experience would reflect that of most in, in, in the Labor caucus. He was somebody who was there uh, to, to dispense wisdom and, and when, when we asked for it. Um, you know, he's a former leader of our party. He really is a giant of our movement. Uh, and he was well-liked across the spectrum of politics, across the aisle. Uh, and, and I think you can see that in the warmth of the, the reaction to the very shocking news that we've heard in the last 24 hours. Indeed. And uh, vindicated, do you think, in terms of that position on the Iraq war? Well, I think history is, is on his side um, and, and, and it continues to be so as every day goes by. And that was a very courageous decision that he took um, when he was uh, leader of the opposition. Not easy to 
um, oppose Australia's involvement in that conflict at that time. But I think I think history um, is on his side going forward, um, and and it, it demonstrates, I think, the the character of, of Simon Cream that he was willing to take a very strong stance at that point based on his beliefs and and his wisdom and experience, which has been borne out.